If you're somebody that has any familiarity with the liturgical church calendar, which admittedly is actually a relatively small group of people, um, you would notice that what we're not doing is celebrating today the last Sunday of Epiphany. Uh, instead, we're honoring the Feast of St. David of Wales. The reason being, besides it's your paternal feast, is that St. David's Day is March the 1st, which is Ash Wednesday. And like it or not, Ash Wednesday trumps poor St. David. <laughs> so what we have done is moved it here to talk about that on this, the last Sunday of Epiphany, and actually, they really do coincide. Because the last Sunday of Epiphany is a celebration of the resurrection power of Jesus, him appearing in great glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, in essence. And then after that, telling his disciples it's going to get tough now, and begins to, in essence, prepare them for his own rejection, death, and eventual resurrection from the dead. I say they cohere because, you see, for David of Wales to be the kind of man that he was, he had to have confidence in the supreme power of God over everything, and that Jesus was, in fact, who he says he was and who he displayed himself to be as the living Son of God. Otherwise, he could never have endured the kind of hardship that he endured with that wonderful sense of graciousness, gentleness, and poise that marked his life even in the most difficult of circumstances. David actually never really wanted the public eye. Though he was born from royal families, he in the 6th century in Wales actually wanted to be a monk and nothing more. In the midst of the huge Viking fights that have been going on through the rest of Great Britain, Wales was a holdout for Christianity and in fact was flourishing even in many other places where in Britain churches had been burned to the ground. He began to form a monastery. What he didn't anticipate was the monastery would absolutely explode with growth. And the town in Wales called St. David's is given that name precisely because that's where the first monast monastery was founded. But soon all of Wales was peppered with evangelists, people who had given their lives for the gospel of Christ and were traveling the countryside preaching the gospel. Even though it was a kind of small empire, he still hid behind the scenes. He taught his monks to live a level of uh, austerity that you and I would find difficult at best, but also tremendous joy. There is, there is a reason there is this line in Proverbs, because it so marked the life of their monastery where he says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted ox and hatred with it. Because theirs was a monastery that was marked by simplicity and yet great love and devotion that they had for each other. You see, in some ways, David's ministry and the way he dealt with his own monks as well as the, the, his people was really marked by what we see in the Thessalonian lesson where Paul uses both the analogy of a nursing mother and a caring father to describe how he dealt with this church that he clearly loved so dearly. It's a testimony to his reserve, his gentleness, that he could appeal to them in the midst of a lot of controversy because he loved them so dearly and they knew it. They knew that Paul loved them and that Paul cared for them. It is exactly the kind of way Jesus also approached people who were hungry to know him. One of the favorite lines, in, particularly in the right one service, in what's called the comfortable words, is the word, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will, what? Refresh you. Jesus knew that there were people who were profoundly longing in the midst of the corrupt leadership of the Pharisees and the Sadducees 
to know something real, something, would act, that, something that would actually minister spiritual truth and vitality into their lives. And it was to them that he, in essence, presented himself, and not falsely, as someone who came to serve, someone who was kind, someone who was careful, someone who cared. And in the midst of that kindness, that gentleness, and their care, people's hearts were one. Miracles happened as they drew near to this new faith and vitality that they were finding in Jesus Christ. That's exactly the way David operated. David was known for his gentleness, for his consideration, for his kindness, and for his carefulness. It didn't mean that he didn't have courage. Actually, quite the opposite. If you were secure and that you know that how God deals with you is in that same kind of care, that kind of tenderness, the willingness to quickly forgive, the commitment to be with you no matter what. It is exactly that security that you have in God that gives you the capacity to be able to stand up even in the midst of very, very difficult situations as a public figure and to speak clearly and truthfully with no sense of bombast, no sense of needing to be heard. In fact, it's, it's love that impels you to speak so that even in your public words, they are still marked by that same kind of love and care and graciousness because you actually love your hearers, even if you disagree with them. That, you see, was David, which is why this, a Thessalonian lesson begins by saying, we had courage in God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our heart. You, you have to be secure to talk like that. I say all of that because in some ways a parish that takes its name from a saint, somehow accepts a calling in the taking of that name. It's not coincidental. Even if the name was chosen by popularity majority rule, God has a wonderful way of operating through even the mixed motives of human behavior to do the things that he would like to do. And therefore, it should mark St. David of Wales in Cocoa Beach to have a certain kind of character about it that's actually reflective of their patron, St. David of Wales, and that it should be different as a result from Holy Trinity, all saints, you fill in the blank, whoever that might be. And I would want to say to you that both the kind of kindness and care that we see in David should in fact, and I want to tell you often is in terms of my experience, the mark of this congregation. You see, people come into congregations, and, and even if they're hungry to know something about Jesus, often they've been burned by the institution. They're very, very suspicious of what actually might be going on in a local church. Right? Nod your head. You know that's true. And so that what often happens is a kind of testing that takes place. Can I trust these people? Can I trust the rector? Is he an okay guy, they will say? <laughs> but after, and what will happen is that more often than not, the person who tentatively is sitting at the back of the church, not so sure about whether they belong or even want to, are eventually enfolded. They're welcomed. They're received for who they are. And they're invited to, in essence, join the rest of you in your life together as St. David of Wales in Coco. It, there's a kind of actually humor about it. There's a certain level of camaraderie. Nobody actually feels like he or she is better than the other person. I mean, that's, that's for people out there. We want to be a congregation that actually cares for everyone and accepts them for who they are so that we might join together as just regular human beings who are marked actually by one thing, and really one thing only. We belong to Jesus Christ, and we're committed to serving him. 
and in committed to serving him, we are committed, and love doing it actually, in serving one another. There's a kind of tenderness about a congregation like that. You can see nobody is actually sort of forcing his or her way up to the front. And in fact, it can even be the mark of a visitor where you see somebody at the coffee hour and he's kind of sounding off, you know, wanting to be impressive, giving you his opinions. And particularly in the climate, the political climate in which we live, sort of testing the waters to make sure that you agree with him. Because if you do, then maybe you'll be his friend. But if not, then maybe you're somebody I need to be suspicious about. That's out there. And in fact, I would hope the way the congregation would, would sort of treat someone like that is just laugh and say, oh, he's a newcomer. He'll get used to us. He, he'll find out that we don't care about a lot of that, at least not in a way that divides us. Because what unites us is far more precious, far more eternal, and far more important than that kind of infighting. And therefore, we guard in some ways with joy our relationships with each other because we want to be a church that cares for one another regardless of where you might be on a particular spectrum. Does, does that make sense to you? Nod your head. Yeah, I hope it does. Because it seems to me that's exactly the kind of church people long for and the kind of church this culture needs. Yesterday, I was at a meeting of the gathering of the youth of the diocese. It was over in Avon Park, Camp Wingman. And one of the things, the whole theme was prayer. And it was the bishop's event. And they picked the subject and set it all up, ran the games, all those sort of things. And, and I was the speaker, and a lot of it was Q&A. And one of the exercises that they did around prayer was that they went to a place where they had these very large whiteboards. And on the whiteboards, what they were supposed to write were names they had been called that didn't look like what it meant for them to be Christian to lay out what had happened if they had been bullied, to describe in a small word, in some ways, the way they saw themselves. And so I walked into the chapel for the closing Eucharist service, and there on the whiteboard with all these different colors were these names. They confessed to depression, to suicide. They talked about how they lied to be included in a group because that was the only way they knew how to fit in. Several had made remarks about how they had resorted to cutting themselves because of the terrible shame they felt on the inside. Family, these are our children. These are our children that go to our churches. And more often than not, to be in that kind of place where you feel bereft has everything to do with the absence of people in whom they could entrust the deepest places of pain in their lives. Alone, alienated, and terrified. Can we be known as churches that welcome people? that make room for people even in the places of great pain where they can be loved with the gospel of Jesus Christ, invited into genuine healing, real wholeness, and joy in the gospel. More importantly than that, can we be agents of that kind of healing, grace, and love? What about your grandchildren? How will your grandchildren know that God loves them and cares for them. Can you be a voice in your family for that kind of kindness and that kind of care? I don't know about the state of your kids and grandchildren, but I know in a lot of families, if you don't speak up, they might not hear at all. And if they don't hear, they will grow up to be the same kind of alienated kids that I saw at the diocesan youth gathering just yesterday. You see, it's both kindness and courage. Kindness 
so that we are in an atmosphere where we feel a new kind of security. God's love is being mediated to us through what we share together in the gospel of Jesus Christ. His love expressed in the sacraments, the fun we have over dinners together, knowing that people are watching out for us and that they count on us and we on them and want to do that. That means that even if I'm going out to talk to people for whom it might not be so welcoming, I've got people back here who are praying for me, who are standing behind me, who are going to call me up. Well, how's it going? How did it go? I know you wanted to have that talk with your grandson. Did it happen? How do you feel like you did? Does he still know you love him? So that what begins to happen is we begin to see ourselves as agents agents of the very love and kindness that we experience here with such joy and plentitude. Because David was marked by both gentleness and kindness and courage. In fact, he was brought into the middle of a huge theological controversy, stood up and spoke about something that was literally about to, to split the Welch church and really almost didn't want to do it was sort of forced into the place of speaking out, did so, and did so with such clarity, he actually wound up being made an archbishop. God wants to use people who know that kind of inner security. It doesn't mean you're not always not afraid sometimes, but it means that there is a kindness from God that is beginning to permeate and change your heart. Not only what you give to the people you know in the pew, but the people you love and care about out there who don't know. That's what it seems to me to be St. David's of Wales Episcopal Church in Cocoa Beach, Florida. People marked by great kindness and people who are willing to express out of the love that they have for others out there that same kind of gentleness, that same kind of clarity, because we know that God loves them just as much as he does us. Amen.